I welcome you all back for the second session of Understanding Communities Through Beta Diversity, Concepts and Tools for Application. In this session, we will be discussing about the partitions of beta diversity and the frameworks of these partitions. Now, beta diversity can be partitioned into two pairs of constituent components. The first pair would be species contribution to beta diversity and site contribution to beta diversity or local contribution to beta diversity. The other pair is the components of nestedness and turnover. Now, let's go through both these pairs individually. In this uh, slide, look at the diagram at the left hand side. This is a hypothetical community where colored shape are species and the blue colored circles and with the patterns are sites. Now a species that is present in all the sites, that is the red color donut shape, it is present in all the sites. It contributes almost nothing to variation because it is present everywhere. Wherever you go, this species will be there. So it is not contributing to variation. Whereas the species which is present at exactly half of the sites, that is 50% of the sites, the diamond shape will contribute the most to variation <coughs> as it is very intuitive from the graphic, uh, graphical representation on the right hand side. Hence, what is important in terms of conservation prioritization with respect to species are those species which are present at 50% of all the sites because these are the species that are driving variation. It is not that species which is found everywhere or not that species which is very rare. Hence, conservation management strategies and prioritization of species should focus on those species that are contributing maximum to beta diversity. Similarly, with respect to sites, a site which has all species or just one species will be the most unique in comparison to all other sites and they contribute most to beta diversity. And this is very intuitive because those sites which have very few biodiversity elements are the ones which would need restoration efforts and those which have maximum biodiversity would need a lot of protection. And hence site 1 and site 4 in this example that you see would need conservation prioritization efforts but the management strategies would be very different for both the sites. For site number 4, it would be more about protection and site number 1, it would be more about restoration. This is a very good example of how beta diversity is a very, very important tool for conservation management and prioritization of conservation efforts. Same way, we have the other component that is the nestedness and turnover component which is equally important in understanding the community composition. Now consider this scenario on the left hand side where alphabets are species. In this community as we move from site 1 to site 2 we are losing 3 species F, G and H they are lost. Same way when we are moving from site 2 to site 3 we are losing species C, D and E. And when we look at this, we see that the composition of site 3 is a very strict subset of site 2 and same way site 2 community structure is a strict subset of site 1. And this is a very perfect example of nestedness. Now let us consider another example. When we move from site 1 to site 2, here we are losing two species but gaining two different species. For example, species C and D from site 1 are replaced by species E and F in site 2, whereas A and B have remained constant. The same happens when we move from site 2 to site 3, where A and B have remained constant, but E and F have been replaced by G and H. This is a very good example of turnover. So, nestedness and turnover scenarios will tell what is the dynamics of the composition of the community that we are looking at when we move from one site to another and this can also be looked in terms of time where we can understand whether communities are nested or ter um, undergoing turnover over time. 
on top of these two frameworks if we add the angle of functional groups if we talk about the functional roles of the species in the community it gives us more insights about the broad processes that operate in the ecosystem and not just about composition of the community with respect to species to understand this aspect let us take a very simple example on your screen you three uh, you see three uh, images of bicycles now when you look at all these bicycles superficially they look very similar they don't look very different however if we you know measure the size of the tires for example to just find out what is the thickness of the tire we can very easily make out that the uh, cycle with thick tires will be a mountain bike and the one with thinner tire will be a road bike and the same way if we measure other kind of features like what is the pattern of the handle what is the pattern of the seat the gears various you know features if we incorporate the functional roles of these bicycles can be uh, discerned very easily whether it's a mountain bike a hybrid bike or a road bike similarly if we extend this logic for a faunal group or a fauna, uh, floral group in this case i am taking example of an ant superficially both this ant look similar they are brown in color more or less same they kind of don't look very different but if we start measuring some important feature for example in this case the size of the eye we can make some ecological inferences about it that is the ant which has larger eye would probably be a surface dwelling ant because it needs vision to maneuver whereas the ant which has very small eye is probably a subterranean ant it does not need good vision to maneuver within the underground terrain that it lives in so this way by measuring some key morphological features we can group various organisms into functional groups and we can do this by the following method of classifying ants into various intuitive functional groups which can be inferred from literature or from field based observation for example ant communities could be divided into these various functional groups based on the various traits that are measured or which are noted down for different ant groups and each of these groups can then be assigned a functional role for example there are certain species of ants with certain kinds of traits which match with those of invasive species there are certain traits which match with you know invertebrate community regulators there are some which match with decomposers movers of organic matter and so on and so forth so when we look at the community composition not just through the lens of species not just through the lens of the kind of species that are making up the community but rather through the lens of the functions that these species have or the roles that they play in the ecosystem it gives us broader insights about what is happening in our ecosystem and we can much more intuitively and easily discern and tease apart the effects of uh, things like climate change biodiversity loss or human influence on understanding how we are gaining or losing functional roles that the organisms play in the environment so the next question that would arise is how do you go about the process of dividing these uh, communities ecological communities whatever they may be with respect to functional groups so i will continue with the example of ants and i will demonstrate how that is done when we take an ant there are several kinds of traits that can be measured hence continuous traits traits like the length of the scape in their antenna the length of the thorax the length of the legs the length of the eyes the length of the mandibles and all these traits are standardized and they are available in literature for various uh, floral and faunal groups both and it is not just continuous traits we can also have categorical traits which are very important in grouping for example traits like polymorphism you know integument sculpture for example in this case uh, yes, you can see that there is a lot of sculpturing on the ants body different ants have different kind of sculpturing so even that is a very important feature then you have colors nest site diet invasiveness response to stress and disturbance so you have various kinds of 
continuous as well as categorical traits that can be used to then build something called as a species trait matrix a species trait matrix is nothing but a data set which has species in one column and the data of various categorical and continuous traits in another column and these are entered as a matrix so this species trait matrix is first prepared and it involves a lot of field work as well as lab work and after that when this matrix is observed and this matrix is prepared we need to transform them into a dissimilarity matrix some amount of background on uh, matrix algebra would be important and necessary for doing this so this trait matrix is converted into a dissimilarity matrix using gauss distance and we use the gauss distance other over other distance methods because this efficiently can combine continuous and categorical variables that is why this method is preferred and after that we perform hierarchical cluster analysis of the distance matrix and we use wards method again a method which is very useful because it can give us a very good amount of parsimonious functional groups that we can identify and then you can cut all of these based on a certain dendrogram height all of this information about where to cut what is the value that needs to be used differs from one group of organism to other and is available on literature and the objective of this uh, third session of this course would be to understand how to execute all of these uh, functions in the r programming language and r studio environment and functional groups then lead us to something much more intuitive it leads us to something which is very uh, essential to our understanding of a very very important ecological concept which is called as functional redundancy now let's look at this example for understanding functional redundancy especially when we are tracking a same site over different time periods now consider this scenario 1 as we had looked in the previous example the shapes with the alphabet here is a species the colors are the functional group and obviously the dotted circle is a single site now as we move from one time period to the other time period we see that species e and f at the bottom are replaced by species g and h and similarly when we are moving from time 2 to time 3 we see that species c and d is replaced by species i and j now if you follow me you will see that even though the species have replaced each other from one time period to another the replacement is done by like for like substitution keeping the functions a constant basically the colors have not changed only the species has changed so this is a very good example that shows that even if species composition will are changing over time the functions can remain stable and this is one kind of an example of functional redundancy where species that are performing the same functions over time will change but the function will remain a constant let us look at scenario 2 as we move from time 1 to time 2 the community is losing two species and same way from time 2 to time 3 again it is losing one species now here we are seeing that in every time section of time the number of species that is the species richness has gone down but the functions that the species were rendering to the ecosystem has not changed that has remained constant and this is an example of what forms the classical definition of functional redundancy that was described by brian walker in 1992 and this is a very important concept because this tells us how beta diversity when we include the concept of functional groups and put all of that in the broad ambit of redundancy can tell us how beta diversity can help us understand about functional properties of an ecosystem of a species 
For example, in scenario two, if we just relied on alpha diversity, we would have said that there is a loss in species. But alpha diversity would not have told me whether the variation that is caused in moving from time one to time two and time two to time three does it also affect functional functionality of the species? That is not being explained by alpha and gamma. That is the inventory diversity. This is the strength of beta diversity, and that is the reason why beta diversity is being more widely used in uh, e ecology or ecosystem-based uh, research in recent period. So, with this, we come to an end of the se uh, second session, and in the third session, we will be looking at how we will be employing these theoretical concepts and applying them to practical data sets in the R studio environment.